Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to work through a bit of a financial planning uh, problem using the time value of money. And this problem relates to the post-retirement benefit. So I don't know if people actually care about such things, but we're going to work through this scenario anyways. So I have this person who's just closing in on retirement, and we need to know what return she is going to get really an effective return here. It's not truly a return. There's no dollars invested. The dollars go into the Canada Pension Plan and she gets a benefit back. But she says, look, is it worthwhile my participation in this post-retirement benefit? And I'll just give a quick reminder here. So between the ages of 60 and 65, if you are working, then your participation, sorry, if you're working and you started CPP. So she's going to be right away in that age 60 to 65 range. She will start CPP at 60. And because of that, the PRB is mandatory. If she uh, gets to age 65, after age 65 and still working, then the PRB becomes optional. But at that point, it is still, um, at this point, this next five years, it's still mandatory. And what happens then is you get a slight bump, about two and a half percent. We'll see that a little bit later on here, uh, but a two and a half percent bump to your Canada Pension Plan, although it is actually paid as two separate benefits. You get the Canada Pension Plan and the CPP PRB. Uh, the difference is, for example, that the PRB cannot be split. It's actually a different benefit. So you can split your Canada Pension Plan retirement benefit with your spouse or common law partner, but you cannot split the PRB with your spouse or common law partner. Now I'm going to sort of uh, fast forward here. We're gonna jump into the second question because it's gonna require me to switch screens and I would rather do that right now. And the second question is around the reasonable mortality assumption. I know that I have to do this kind of calculation anytime I have one of these retirement income questions. So we're going to use, because it's a readily available resource and it's well laid out for us, we're going to use the FP Canada projection assumption guidelines. And the FP Canada projection assumption guidelines give us um, and I'll look at, I'll leave the uh, link to these as well in the comments, or you can also download the app. The FP Canada app is quite good. You can put in uh, any given situation, it'll spit back a reasonable set of mortality assumptions. So we're looking here at um, our client's likely age of mortality, and we know that she is age 60. So we can pull or she will be age 60 right away. So we'll use the age 60 row here. And what the uh, sort of preliminary notes to this tell us, or the lead in notes, is for most people, we wanna use the 25% column. Uh, so we have a female here, age uh, 96, sorry, age 60. And we say a financial planning assumption should assume mortality at that age. Now there are reasons to use 10% or 50%, for example, so what FP Canada says is for somebody who's in really good health, we want to use the 10% column. For somebody who is in sort of a normal health range for their age, we want to use the 25% column. And that is a little bit conservative. That means we're going to have a number of people, presumably 25%, if you have a big enough client base, who actually die uh, between age 91 and 96, about 75% of your client base again, assuming a large enough client base, would in theory be dead by then age 96, leaving about 25% of your client base living to or past that age. Now, this is different from what an actuary will do when calculating pension numbers. Uh, the actuary is perfectly fine to use the 50% column because they're working on the law of large numbers and they can in fact, be wrong half the time and right half the time. And if you've got a big enough group of people to work with, that works out quite nicely. Uh, the financial planner, however, has to take into account that if they're wrong for half their clients, that's quite 
consequential. So that's where we use an age 96 mortality assumption. And I would suggest that in reality, that as the client gets into their sort of mid 80s and beyond, that we have the ability to adjust those financial plans, at least to some extent, or we wanna build in that ability to adjust those plans. We wanna deal well with longevity risk. And I believe for what it's worth that uh, longevity risk is a poorly understood risk uh, amongst sort of the typical client and that people really need, I think, a little bit of a push that it's likely that they are going to live these relatively long lives, that a good portion of the population is going to live into their 90s and that you can't count on dying sort of at your mid 80s or whatever. I think sometimes people apply a heuristic that says, yeah, I'm gonna be dead by the time I'm 83 or 85 or whatever, that really supports under saving for retirement or potentially overspending in retirement. And a little bit of a, a wake up call might be useful. Uh, this chart does have a fair bit of data on it, but I think if you sort of highlight ages like I've done here, and we can recognize that this comes from uh, a reliable scientific source that we get uh, a tool we can use to help clients recognize their real longevity risk. So anyways, we're gonna use age 96, and let's just pop back then to the problem. So now again, we have Jennifer. So where are those that have done any kind of work with me on time value of money will know I am going here is we're gonna start by drawing a line. So we're gonna draw our line and we're not going to be ready to solve right away, but we can work with this. So we're gonna look at the years from age 60 to 96. So that's simple enough, that's 36 years. And we're going to solve for a rate. So we know we're solving for IY. That's what the question tells us. Calculate Jennifer's return on her PRB premium. So rate or IY or return or a compound annual growth rate, whatever it is, we're really substituting in an IY calculation for calculating the value of Jennifer's contribution here. And then we need a payment. So the payment is going to be based on her PRB benefit. We'll calculate that right away. And then we say, well, what's it going to cost her so the present value, at least the way that I think is the correct way to do this, would be based on her PRB premium that she would pay at that age of 60. Now, this is where I could get a little bit pickier and I could say, well, really what she's gonna do is that PRB premium she pays at 60 isn't really going to start until 61, so maybe we should use 35 years here. We're kind of eyeballing it anyways, so maybe I wanna be picky on that, maybe I don't, but let's use 35 years. And then we can say, well, the future value is going to be zero, there's going to be nothing left at mortality. Okay, so now I can figure out some of these numbers. Uh, first off, to get to her PRB premium. Now we're in the midst of this transition period around CPP, so we're just gonna use this year's numbers. We know that the YMPE this year is 58,700, that's the 2020 YMPE, and the 2020 contribution rate is 5.25%. So it's going to cost her, oh, and I should take out the, sorry, exemption. We'll take out the $3,500 exemption. And then on that difference, on that uh, $55,200, it's going to cost her 5.25%. That number is changing next year, 2021, that'll be 5.45%, which makes this a little bit of a difficult thing to do as we have a moving target here with uh, Canada Pension Plan. So we can plug those numbers into our calculator to figure out what it will cost her. And it's important to note that we have to assume she is employed here. If she were self-employed, then this would be twice as expensive. She would have to pay both the employee and employer portions. Keep in mind, she does get a tax credit for these contributions, and you might want to work that into your calculations 
the trade-off is that the benefit is also taxable. So it's tough to say whether we should really be uh, taking everything into account as after-tax dollars or however you want to do it. It depends how much for the fidelity you want to apply here. So anyways, we're going to have a $2,898 cost to participate in the PRB. That's her premium. Okay. So that to me is the right number to use for our present value. We're going to use 2898 here. And then we want to figure out what her uh, PRB benefit is going to be. That is, what's she actually going to get out of this? Okay. And this is where we can have a look at this. We say, okay, her age 65 estimated CPP benefit. And there is a little bit of artificiality here because we don't really know what that age 65 benefit will be until age 65. But this is how this is calculated. So she starts at age 60 and she's going to face then a 36% reduction. So she's really locking in her benefit here. And this is where we'd uh, jump in and look at what's happened over her 42 working years. I don't want to do that calculation for her. We can just trust that Service Canada gives us the right information and calculates this properly. And honestly, I'm not aware of situations of Service Canada not doing this properly. So that's probably a reasonable assumption. So she's going to have $716.80. That would be her age 60 uh, CPP based on that CPP based on that 36% reduction. The PRB is going to provide a benefit that's roughly two and a half percent of her uh, CPP benefit. So we'll take that times two and a half percent, and that gives us seventeen dollars and ninety-two cents. That's going to be her monthly benefit. from the CPP PRB, okay? So that describes for us then really what is the payment in this case. So now we have a present value and a payment, that being $17.92. And just so that we can see how this is working, what that really means is at age 60, so if we're tracking this kind of year after year after year, at age 60, she's going to have a cost of $2,898. And in exchange for that, that gets her an annuity of $1,792 a month for life. And that's going to be indexed, of course, that's an indexed amount. And then she's gonna do the same thing at age 61. So at age 61, she's gonna spend another, although it'll be a little bit larger, but ignoring inflation, another $2,898 gets her another, an additional 1792, again, ignoring inflation per month for life. And then it's gonna be the same, we're gonna have that same cycle every year that she participates in the PRB. Now, every year that she gets older, that really means that the annuity she's paying for is one year less attractive. So when she's 65, she's five years older, she's still paying the same amount, the $2,898, uh, but it's going to be paid for five fewer years because she wouldn't be getting it from age 61 to age 65. She'd only be getting that benefit when she's uh, 65, assuming she's still working and participating in PRB, that's where another 2898, again, ignoring inflation, uh, gets her that 1792 a month for life. So it's sort of this gradually reducing benefit. What we're looking at here is the benefit at age uh, 60. So now we can go through and solve the problem and we're just going to write out all of our values. Again, those who have done financial calculator work with me. You've seen me do exactly this thing lots and lots of times. And 
we're going to solve this on end mode. The PRB is paid at the end of each month. So her uh, PY, the PRB is going to be paid monthly. We'll do that. Compounding, we'll use an annual return here that probably best approximates everything else that's happening in Jennifer's life. Times PY is going to be 35. IY is what we're going to compute. Present value, she's paying $2,898. Uh, that's going out of her pocket, so I'm going to use that as a negative. My payment here, $1,792, and future value at zero. So now we'll pop over to the calculator and plug in our numbers. See if we can make the calculator big. Yeah, that works nicely. And we'll go through and do the whole thing. So we're going to start by clearing our time value of money here. And then we'll bring up our CY and PY menu. We're going to put in our PY at 12 and our CY at 1. So now PY is 12 and CY is 1. We can get out of that menu. And we'll plug in 35 into our times PY spot. So N at 420. Uh, we don't know our IY yet. We'll leave that. Our present value, negative 2898. We'll plug that into our present value spot. And payment at 1792. Payment and then zero as our future value. And now we've got all of our numbers in there and we can compute that IY. Pretty good rate of return actually for somebody who is in retirement. Again, keeping in mind that this benefit is also indexed to inflation. So she's getting a 6.91% or 6.92%, I guess, uh, real uh, rate of return. I would suggest that that's an accurate uh, use of a real rate of return because that benefit is going to index to inflation. Now that gives us a good indicator of the value of contributing to the PRB at age 60. We can play around with this a little bit more and we can say, okay, what about at 61? So at 61, remember it's gonna be one year less of benefit and it's actually gonna be a little bit more expensive because of the CPP enhancement. We won't worry about that here. We can just plug in, we can sort of play around with this a little bit. We can say, well, at age 60, it's only 34 years of income, assuming she lives to her uh, projected mortality. So now we can change our N down to 408 and we can resolve our IY. And we see that brings that return down to 6.84%. Uh, And then we can do the same thing at age 62. And as with any financial calculator problem, then you can really play around with all the variables. So we'll do for 62, that's gonna be 33 years that we plug in. Now we're down to 396 and we can compute our IY again. And we see that return just decreasing a little bit every passing year. So now we're down to 6. 0.77% and so forth. And we could do other things here. We could say, what if she lives a shorter period of time? What if she lives into that 50% column? Uh, what if she lives longer than that? There's all kinds of what ifs you can play around with here. And if you really want to uh, roll that out into a ton of what if scenarios, we can launch that in Excel. I hope that's helpful. Again, I don't know if it's an entirely realistic scenario. Uh, it's probably a valid type of exam question just to have this idea about how to calculate the uh, sort of estimated return on a retirement stream of income. Uh, there is a fair bit of this kind of thing now in the advanced curriculum. Those of you who are getting ready to write your CFP exam, uh, this would be a common type of advanced curriculum question where you really have to figure out the value of a retirement stream of income 
for core curriculum, I would suggest this is still relevant uh, if you're just getting ready for the QAFP exam, still relevant, probably less likely you have to do this kind of math for core curriculum uh, in that it, it involves a fair bit of assumption and sort of conceptual work, but still every bit of detail on here is relevant for the uh, QAFP and core curriculum. All right, thanks very much. I hope that that was useful and enjoy your continued studies.